Hi everyone, it is 7.30, so that means it's time to find our fairy tales and yes, slay some dragons. You know, growing up, I watched a lot of news with my family, probably no surprise that I wound up doing what I do now as a news anchor. And of course a novelist too, because of my, my love of telling stories, other people's stories and trying to figure out uh, the world a little better and where we belong in it through both of those things. So hi everyone, thanks so much for uh, joining. I see people waving, hello, hello, hello. Uh, you know, I remember watching the news as young as maybe five years old, I, the Challenger blowing up. That was a huge formative thing for me to watch, that there was a teacher on board. And it was when I started to really understand how precarious life was and that there was a job out there talking about how to how to cope and how to to come together. I remember actually maybe even younger than five, my parents becoming very quiet, very quiet and watching. And I said, what's going on? And I saw people pulling bricks off a wall and I didn't understand what was happening. And they said, the Berlin Wall is coming down. Whether it was a hurricane, an election, uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the news and the people delivering it draws together. And I watched the news with my family and the people who gave us the news felt like family. And for me growing up, there were so many fewer outlets, right? There were the three major networks. And on those three networks, there were the three major morning shows. You had Good Morning America, you had the Today Show, and you had the early show. And on the early show was anchor Maggie Rodriguez. And she's a face that I'm sure you'll recognize. And she has an incredible story about not only the fight and, and having the, the bravery to trailblaze, but also the courage to know when it was time for a new adventure. She's joining us live tonight. And one of my favorite things she has said to me about the whole idea of find your fairy tale, she says the secret to your happily ever after is to write your own fairy tale. And I think that that's what's so important is sometimes there are so many different voices out there that tell you what success is, that tell you what your success is. But if it doesn't feel right anymore, if it doesn't feel like the right journey, then that's when your dream has evolved and you've evolved. And I think about that a lot as, as we all come into these different chapters in our lives, whether it's parenthood or maybe we've switched careers. And I think just sort of surviving a, a pandemic together has made us all second guess how we're spending our time and are we living it right? And do we have the right small circle around us? So hi, Maggie. You're hi. I was Let trying me. to figure this out. I finally got it. We're gonna turn you. Can you turn your um turn your phone? phone? Ready? Whoop, and then perfection. Okay, let's see if I can put it on this stand and keep it here. Yeah. I am so technical. Trust me, it took me forever to not only for, it's it's nice to see your face again, well, even though it's from a distance. It, I guess, which is gonna be interesting. Mm -hmm. We can take a minute, take a minute and get settled. The beauty of Instagram Live and just the situation that we're in is that we can take our time and kind of deal with the technical glitches and get settled in because... Yeah, you know, the last time I had to worry about my own technology, I was starting as a reporter and I yeah. was editing and editing my own video. And the, the equipment was much more complicated than this iPhone. Yet I and heavier. This phone. Go figure. Well, so, the phone, see, it can so. be tricky. It can be tricky, but I certainly don't want you to be stuck holding it for the entire yeah, time. Either. So I'm trying Because to... I plan on making you talk to me for a very long time. <laughs> Your arm will get tired. I don't have to hold it. It's not going on that little stand that set up here. Hmm. Do you have some books we can put on? <laughs> Live TV, sort of. Let's see. So you did work in LA. My question is, have you ever covered an earthquake? Because that's kind of what's going on. That is on. hysterical. You know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't covered one because there were only little jolts when I lived there. Yeah. I lived there from now. Oh, wait, I think I figured this out. Hold on. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm completely distracted. Your viewers are like, who is this crazy No, 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 person? Maggie, don't even like, we, we cooked a dinner on Tuesday with an amazing yes, chef, saw, but yes. it kept freezing on us and we just, we turned it into a dance party. I mean, this is, this is how we have to hang out right now until I can be with people <laughs> I think in I person it. again. The other thing too is everybody who's oh, hanging out with me. There you I go. Got it. I got it. Yay. Okay. We are settled. That was we we actually officially literally just came in for a landing. Look who showed up <laughs> to say hi. Oh my goodness. 
My you baby's right out. Looks exactly like this, correct? Yeah, I, I would have to get up and go drag her in because I think I'm right now she's right like, too. You gotta go, gosh. buddy. Okay, go. Looks go. exactly like my dog. I want my kids to take him. Go, go, go over there. Go. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi to everyone. You know, Hi, I, I was just saying that the the faces of the three morning shows became so familiar to so many of us because that's how we started our day you know it was it was cereal coffee the weather and our friends yes. on these these major networks but it certainly didn't start you know that way for you a lot of people say how in the world that's the top that is the top, the top. Mm -hmm. and you had quite a a journey up and i would say i would say you kind of catapulted i mean Talk about how you first got into TV. It's funny because when, when you're at that level, people always say, how did she get there? It happened overnight. And that's what people think because they don't see everything that came before. The 15 years that preceded it as a local reporter, like I said, first in a, in a little tiny cable station in Miami, it was like cable access, yeah. where I shot and edited two packages, two stories a day, every day, one in English and one in Spanish. And wow. it, was, it was no joke. I would carry my own equipment. And back then, it wasn't a little iPhone. It was these big decks and these huge cameras. And you wore those blazers with the shoulder pads that were in style. And I would show up at these city council meetings, because that's the kind of stories I was covering, sweating. And the photographers from all the other stations felt so sorry for me. And they'd say, can I shoot your stand up for you? Can I help you in any way? So that's what I was doing. It was absolutely not glamorous. And, in the, and that was what I was doing part time. The rest of the time, I was working behind the scenes at one of the stations in Miami as an assignment editor. So I would work weekends as an assignment editor, then do my little cable reporting job during the week and trying to, you know, constantly talking to people at the station where I worked at as an intern and as an assignment editor to let me on the air. Look, I'm a reporter at this cable station. Please give me a shot. I can do it. I would show yeah. them my tape. I would go in the news director's office and be like, see, I'm getting better. See, I'm getting good. I mean, I was in there. I was my own advocate. 24 seven, driving them crazy, showing them my work, begging. And then uh, Hurricane Andrew hit. It was 1992 okay. and I was, I went to work. I woke up after the hurricane, I went to work because that's what you do when you're in news. That's your instinct. So I show up at work and there are barely any reporters there. The streets were blocked, they couldn't get there. Oh, and they were okay. desperate for reporters. And I said, Me, here I am. you know, you know, I want to do this and you need people. And they're like, go Maggie. And that was at Univision Channel 23 in Miami, a Spanish station. That was my first time on the air at a major station. And I never got off the air after that. I worked for a few years in Spanish TV. And then I wanted to jump to English because though I'm fluent in Spanish, English is my first language. And also I thought there would be many more opportunities in English. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how do I do this? I don't have any video to show anybody of me speaking English. What do I do? I'm a, I'm oh, how funny. Theory. I didn't even think about that, that your whole resume tape would be in a different right? language. Yeah. So a news director's watching me going, well, I wonder if she speaks English. She seems fine. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit on a desk in the middle of the newsroom. Yeah. And I'm going to record an intro and say, hi, my name's Maggie Rodriguez. As you can see, I speak perfect English, but all of my experience is in Spanish. I just wanted them to hear me. So right. I, knew, I speak the language. And then I translated one of the stories that I had done in Spanish to English so they could hear the way that I sounded reporting in English. And mm -hmm. I sent that tape off. And then I got an agent who sent that tape off. And he says, you're not going to believe this. You have an interview in Los Angeles, which is one the second largest market, you know, in the country. After yeah. New York. Yeah. Uh, this is a news director. She just joined this station, KABC Channel 7. It's the number one station in L.A. You would be her first hire. She's looking for young reporters, 24 years old, Sorvani. I go out to talk to her and she's like, I don't know, you're so young and you don't, you've never done this in English. But you feel so old that when, when I was 24, I was like, I'm ready. I'm ready to sit at the helm of the news desk anywhere in America. You don't know how young you are until you're not 24 anymore. So you were That's probably exactly like, wow. Right. This is I where I belong. Do it. And so yeah. I convinced her, right? Because if, if you're confident, I guess they feel you. And, and she gave me a shot. And my, my first day on the air in LA, I remember one of the photographers came up to me and said, hi, are you a new intern? I said, no, I'm a new reporter. Oh, no. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I mean, the people there, that's where I learned everything I know. I mean, wow, did I have a great school at KABC. And I was there for a good long while, six years, and then out of the blue, because everything in my career has happened just by chance, 
which is by destiny and by design, but it seems to be by chance, right? So I get a, I get a call out of the blue from a news director in Miami, which is my hometown. Yeah. She says, you know, I kind of saw you, I don't know how, satellite TV or something, and my husband happened to know that you're from Miami, and I'm looking for a new main anchor here at CBS in Miami. Would you be interested? And I said, well, gosh, yeah, you know, I, I'm under contract here, but maybe I can work it out. And I worked it out with them that I was able to transfer to Miami. Gosh, this keeps going black now. There we go. As the oh, main anchor of my home. It did that to me my first time, the whole time. It just, what do you it's do? You going just tap the screen? Yeah, because it's going oh, to sleep on dark. you and without changing the setting. These are the things that I've learned. So the good news is you can't see us, but we never stop seeing you. So don't even worry if it goes black. Oh, okay. Should I mess with the light? It's very bright, very dark. Anyway, as long as you can see me. Okay. We can see you. So then, um, yeah, so I was working in LA. Then the Miami news director called, and I thought Miami's my hometown. That's where yeah. I want to live. That's where I want to live forever. Took that job, and let me tell you, I thought that was it, Sorbani. I didn't want anything more. I couldn't have asked for anything more. I met my husband there. Uh, we had our daughter. We bought a house. It was perfect. That was your happily ever after. <laughs> it was, or so you thought. After. And you know, I had no aspirations for anything more. I never even thought of the network. I loved my job. I loved my life. And then uh, the Super Bowl comes to town. Yeah. And it's being broadcast on CBS and all of the network executives from CBS are in town and they see me on the air. And I guess they liked what they saw because a few days after the Super Bowl, I have a voicemail on my phone and it was the assistant to the president of CBS News. I don't know if you wow. remember a show called Punked. This is yes. a long time ago. Ashton Kutcher hosted. No, no, I, I know that show. <laughs> anyway, right? they, they play tricks on people. And so I, I heard the message, hi, this is so-and-so from so-and-so's office. And I'm like, yeah, right. Would you please call us? We'd like to speak with you. Uh, we saw you. He saw you in Miami on TV, and he thinks you're fantastic, and he'd like to speak with you. I'm like, okay, I'm going to play along. I didn't believe it for a minute. I'm dialing the 212 number, still not believing it, still thinking, you know, looking for the hidden cameras around the newsroom. <laughs> and she gets on the phone, so it's his office. I'm like, what? It's and real. I realize, and she puts me right through. Yeah. And it, I don't have to say so-and-so. It was Sean McManus. He was the president of, of CBS News at the time. And he says, you know, we were in town, we saw you, we think you're terrific. How would you like to come fill in on the weekend morning show sometime? And I said, are you kidding me? I would love that. I thought it's the best of both worlds. I get to do that. And my station won't have a problem with it because it's on it's CBS. CBS, so right. It'll be promoting their anchor. So I went and I did it. And the first time I did it, right after I got off the air, I called my husband and I said, he goes, we're in trouble, aren't we? And I go, why do you say that? He goes, you look like you really belong there. I go, honey, this is what I was born to do. I mean, okay. I, I got to do news. I got to do fun stuff. And it was just like, oh, no. Why did I open this can of worms? I, I was happy. But, but, but still, I thought, whatever. It was just filling in. It's just something I'm yeah. going to do once in a while if I'm lucky. And it turned into, oh, hang on a second, OK? Yes. Okay, sorry. I was getting a mess. I have a kids, as you know, and they're, they're yeah. trying to pay attention. Oh, I hear, so, I hear mine. <laughs> so anyway, I feel like I'm rambling. I'll just make it brief. It turned into fill in a few times, then it turned into come do the weekends, then it turned into come do the weekdays, and, and that's how it happened. And you know, you said you opened up a, a whole can of worms because you were happy. And I, I think that that was an interesting phrasing of it because we're almost conditioned, like, if we're happy in a place that we are, proceed with caution, because what if this other adventure isn't the right thing? How did you know in your heart of hearts that that was, that was the big step to take? Was it just, hey, this is the top of this career. I have to. I have to see it through. Well, there was that part of me that felt that way. Number two, I really, really enjoyed it and wanted to do it. But I said no to them when they offered me the job because wow. it wasn't just me. I had mm -hmm. a baby and I had a husband who had a fantastic job in Miami as well. I'm, you know, I, that's too much to ask. So I respectfully declined and that made them want me more. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it was a dilemma. So I said to my husband, I'm not going if you're not on board with this. And if you can't get a job that you love and deserve over there too. So he made a call to his boss. He was uh, running the Telemundo station in Miami. Telemundo is a Spanish language network that's headquartered in Miami. 
um, but their sales department is in New York. And he called his boss, the president of the network, and said, gosh, this is happening to Maggie. I'm just curious, is there any chance that there's anything going on in New York that I could do? And he said, well, as luck would have it, you know, we have a head of sales position for the network opening up in New York. So it all came together because the, the amazing opportunity for my husband came along at the same moment that it came along for me. Our daughter was a baby about to start school. I thought, the universe is telling me, go. Yeah. And it was right for all of us, and so that's why I went. You know, it's interesting because a lot of people feel like they want something and they don't know how to get there. And then I feel like you were happy and suddenly things were presented to you. What do you think about your outlook or just the preparation and the level of hard work that you were putting in that kind of made opportunity, coincidence, luck and fate just, just line up? Yeah, you know Oprah's famous quote, which I love, that luck is opportunity meeting preparation, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I was happy going along, doing my job, not even thinking that somebody important could be watching. It's just about taking pride in what you do and doing your best every single day. Because in our field, it's true. You, first of all, you owe that to your viewers, but also you never know who's watching. So if I wasn't doing a good job that day and I hadn't impressed those people, that opportunity would have never come to me. So I think that if you're happy, just do what you do, work towards what makes you happy, work hard at it, and then the universe might throw something in your way that you didn't plan for, but that might be right. And there will be signs that will tell you this is right or this isn't right. As I mentioned, for me, the signs were there that it was right. And, and boy, was it. It was a lot of fun. And I think a lot, of, a lot of people who embark, especially when they're young, we equate happiness with our career. And that's how we carve out our identity. But then things change. And was that how it was? For you, was obviously, you know, you wanted your family to be happy and that weighed in and that's why you made the, the decision to say no at first. Yes. But, but let's say, you know, that, that Hurricane Andrew day yeah. where you were blazing and ready to go. I mean, you probably thought, hey, this is all I want. This is all I need to be happy and to matter. Yes, I felt that way from the second that I interned at my first TV station, I knew it's what I wanted to do. I was interning there for free. Back then, interns weren't paid. Every day of the summer for a bunch of summers, my friends were all at the beach partying and I was interning because if you love something, you have a passion for it, you don't mind yeah. doing it, you want to do it. It's all you can right. think and live and breathe. So I love TV news and I still loved it, obviously, when I moved to New York. And it required so much more work and effort, believe it or not, because people think by the time you reach the top, it's kind of cushy. And yeah, in a lot of ways it is, but it's also so much more pressure and so much more competitive and high stakes that you have to be on your game. Just, just it's a whole different playing field, uh, you know, if you can imagine. So I had to be even more involved than I ever was before in my career. And I loved it and, and it was going perfectly well until, <laughs> until uh, I started to feel kind of rumblings of something's not right. When my daughter, sorry, this keeps going black when my daughter um, kind of got older and started to be able to formulate thoughts and share her feelings with me, she would say little things that would stab at my heart. She would say things like, well, why, why don't you ever take me to school? You know, I, I worked mornings, I, I can't take her to school. I can't even see her in the morning. Um, oh, one day she said to me, I always tell this story, mom, why can't you be my nanny? You know, we had a live-in nanny and in her wow. office, the nanny was the person who took care of you and was always there for you and did, I still get choked up, and did things with you. And she didn't understand why I couldn't be her nanny. Oh, so that one got me. And so I started to feel like this is messed up. I mean, there's no question that the job came first. It, it had to, if I was going to do that job, I felt that's what I needed to give it. I wasn't going to do it halfway. So that kind of got me a little, mm, you know, unsettled and thinking, but, but I still didn't have any plans to leave. And then I got pregnant again. And I remember we went to Miami, my hometown and my husband's hometown, and he and I are driving and I'm pregnant and our, our daughter's in the back. And I'll never forget looking at the Miami skyline. There I was at home. We were, had spent the day with family. And I said to him, we Oh, and of course, that's right when she freezes. She, she left us hanging in the ultimate tease. There you are. Am I and uh, we lost you right as you said. You turned to your husband and you said, 
because you like that cliffhanger? I was like, and? <laughs> and? <laughs> I turned to my husband and said, would you think I'm absolutely crazy if I tell you that I'm done? You, what are you talking about? What are you done with? I said, I don't think I want to do this anymore, this job. Would it be crazy if I just stopped and retired and came to live here? And he says, you know what? I'm going to let you do whatever you want. I'll just say that that would make me the happiest guy in the world <laughs> if, if it would make you happy. You know, he says, but it's on you. He says, I never want it to be that I pushed you to do this. He says, that's 100% on you, but I would have no problem with it. And so, but then I thought, you know what? My contract's coming up soon. Will I really have the guts when mm -hmm. they show you that contract and say, here, let's do this again to walk away. Right. I, I knew I wanted to, but I wasn't sure I'd have the courage. And this is another one of those moments when fate steps in. So I get a call to come in and see the news president. And he tells me that they're switching up the whole team. The entire morning team is being replaced. And he says to me, but I have this press release that I'm going to read to you. And it just says that you're staying with the network and you're going to keep doing everything you've been, else you've been doing, filling in for Katie Couric on the evening news, doing stories for Sunday morning, which, you know, is storyteller's mecca. Yeah. Um, doing stories for 48 hours. And, you know, we're going to give you this other position that would require you working weekends. It's an anchor position on the weekend. Okay. And I said, no, not okay. Am I there? Yeah. yeah. And I you're said, there, no, you're there. Not, yeah. Not, so, not, so you, he, he, and he did you me. say it right away or was that in your mind? I mean, we talk about uh, uh, on this series, we talk a lot about also slaying your dragons and you talk about, you know, the doubt that must have coiled right around you where you thought, this is what I want. But you also have a society that places such value on these celebrity roles, on these, these, jobs that put you out in front of America. You must have been like, what, what am I thinking? What am I thinking? Or did you have ultimate clarity in that moment? You know what's funny, Sorbani? I didn't hesitate for a minute and it shocked him. He goes, okay. He read it to me, he goes, okay. And I go, no, I, I, I don't wanna do this. I said, can I, can today be my last day? And he said, what you, no, you're being rash. I understand you're upset. Take some time to think about it. I'm like, no, you don't understand I'm not upset. I, I had this feeling that I maybe didn't want to do this anymore. And you're offering me a position that's fantastic, but that would take me farther away from my goal, which is to spend more time with my family. If I say yes to you, these are all unbelievable roles. And the Maggie of six, seven years ago would have jumped on it. I mean, of course, but the Maggie of today with a babe, with a brand new baby, I had just had my son with a toddler is not okay with a job that's gonna have her on a plane four days a week and working weekends. I said, so respectfully, no thank you. And so can today be my last day? And he said, yeah, okay, but I encourage you to take some time to think about it. I walked out of his office, I got in the car and my phone starts to ring. And it's the executive producers from all those other programs that I mentioned to you that I worked with. Yeah. Are you crazy? We heard that you want to leave. Don't do it. You're crazy. You can't walk away from all this. You don't, people don't walk away from this. And I said, I am walking away from this and nothing's going to change my mind. And I talked to my husband and I told him and he said, I support you a hundred percent. Are you sure? Are you sure? And I said, I'm sure if you're good, I'm good. And he had already talked to his boss when I had had that talk with him back in Miami. He had kind of put feelers out. If mm -hmm. I wanted to return to Miami, hypothetically, would there be an opportunity for me? And since his network Telemundo is headquartered in Miami, it was no problem for him to transfer. So we did it. So he transferred back. Yeah. Transferred I, it's, back. it's interesting, though, because so many people called you and you said they said people don't walk away from this. And I think that goes back to to the heart of what strikes me about you and your journey is you were strong enough to not care what people thought and to know in your heart of hearts that you wanted to be with your children and that you wanted to spend time with your family. So if there's somebody out there now who's sort of weighing those decisions, you said you were, you were sent messages and you, you had feelings. What, what do you need to look for in terms of how you're feeling or even how, what, how you're performing? I'm not gonna say that it's absolute, absolute certainty you know, because for example, the very next morning, I took my daughter to school for the very first time in my life. 
right? I would have been at work, but I took her to school. Mm -hmm. I remember in the taxi on the way over, she was telling, talking, talking nonstop. So excited I was with her. Mommy, dad and I uh, count school buses on the way to school. Do you want to play that game? We count the school buses. And it's just so excited. And then when I dropped her off and she waved at me and went up those little stairs, I was like, see, that's, that's what life's about. And I walked home, it was snowing and my phone rang again and it was the president of another network. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to take a break. And he said, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. He says, don't take a break too long. He goes, mm -hmm. because one day you might wake up and regret it. And you think about that. I mean, those words, of course you think about them, but I can honestly tell you that I'm still waiting to wake up regretting it because I haven't. Not that it's been all roses. My God, every parent knows it isn't. <laughs> but, but it's it's what I want to do. And, and I don't have any what ifs because I had I had the opportunity to have this unbelievable career and leave while my kids were still babies and I could still lose my children. It's a gift to be able to do both of them. That's that you the had those I two think. very distinct chapters. What if somebody didn't get that unbelievable career? Maybe they did things in reverse. Maybe they started their family young and they have that big dream. How would they reframe their, their thought process and evolve their, their dream to match their lifestyle? You know what I think? I think that, that your happily ever after and your definition of happiness changes depending on the stage of your life. So when I was young, it was all about my career. I didn't even think about getting married or having children. It wasn't in my head. I, so I put my energy towards having this career because everything inside me, I really did a lot of thinking. I analyzed my life and my goals and, and I set a goal for myself and that was the goal. And everything I did was to work towards that goal. And then I met my husband and things started to change and I had a different goal. So what I would say is that you have to constantly reevaluate your goals and say, what do I want most from life right now at this stage in my life? And then don't do things that are gonna take you in an opposite direction, do things that are gonna take you towards that goal. If I would have taken that job that day, left the morning show and done all those other unbelievable things. Yeah, I would have impressed a lot of people and had a lot of cool adventures. But what about my kids, my little kids, all the years I would have missed all these unbelievable precious years that I would have missed. That wasn't my goal. So that wasn't the direction I took. So I think that when somebody somebody feels a, a nagging inside to change something, I say, think, ask yourself, honestly, drown out the world, drown out what you're supposed to do. What do you want to do? What, what is good for you in your life? And then work, take actions that take you in that direction. And you'll get there, or at least as close as you can get, and you'll feel that you accomplished, at least you tried. It's funny because I, I call that finding your beach because you know I was in Boston for 15 years and, and that, that nagging that you're talking about, it started to sort of creep into my life. And it wasn't that I didn't love what I was doing and it wasn't that I wasn't at incredible stations surrounded by amazing people. And having, you know, I, I say that reporting is, was the adventure of a lifetime. Yeah. And it, it really is because you, you live other people's lives for that day and you see their perspective and you learn so much and it keeps you so grounded. But at the end of the week, when it was time to unwind, the pace of life and how we were spending time wasn't leaving my heart at peace. I wanted a beach. I mean, well, here I am. Here I am in Tampa. So whatever it is that you're- Did you is, literally want a beach? Did you know specifically you wanted a beach? The beach and everything that it felt like. Everything that it felt like. You know, just the, the ability to sit back, to soak up sun, to slow down. I think that really for me, the beach meant slow down. And I needed to take a step back to get to know myself again and to get to know myself without the, the TV face, the TV makeup, the TV uh, pace of life. I mean, I was moving fast. So, you know, your story resonates so much with me because it is, it starts like such a small voice, doesn't it? Where it says something needs to change. Something needs to be a little different. And Until you, know, you can't things, ignore it. Did you, you can't. feel that it got to the point that you're like, okay, I get it. I have to do something. Yeah, or something, in your case, you've been lucky enough that something has happened to you. But again, it's, it's kind of the notion of coincidence favors the prepared mind. It's, it's that you were ready for that, for that to happen. But what about now? 
what about now? What about now? Well, I'm still in chapter two, which is mommy mode. My daughter yeah. is now 15. That little girl that I took to school for the first time when she was five um, is now 15, starting to drive, starting high school. My son is 10, just started fifth grade. And I, I, am, I am mom, you know, I, I laugh because when my, when my phone pings now, it's usually like, I don't know, my, my daughter saying, uh, can you come here? Or my husband saying, we're out of eggs. And it makes me <laughs> laugh as I think back to my previous life. You know, it used to ping and it was like a, a source with an important story or some breaking news. And it's just the tale of two lives. You know, your inbox is filled with emails from Groupon and Target, not, you know, the Dow and CBS News. It's, it's a whole other thing, but it fills me in a different way. And I would say in a much deeper way. And that's what I've discovered because, you know, I was, I, I think I was scared that I would feel like I was just a mom. When I left after having this fascinating career where people looked up to me and thought that what I did was very cool, I was going to go do something that everybody does. And what's the big deal there? And I did fear that it would be kind of boring and, and people would, you know, would not think that I was interesting anymore. But in the end, it really is not about what people think. It's about that introspection that I talk about. Is this satisfying me? Is this really fulfilling me? And the answer was, oh my God, yes, and in, a, in such a much deeper way. So I always say that the lows in parenting are much lower and the highs are much higher than when I was working in TV. And I'll tell you a, a brief story. My husband, yeah. Jeff, that he loves to tell this story that he always admired how he would call me after the show. I had had a, a huge interview, you know, a, a president or a big newsmaker and he says that I was always cool as a cucumber, like not flustered, like, oh, yeah, yeah, that went well, great, you know, I, whatever. It's just what I did. I, it, it didn't phase me. I thought it was awesome, but it, he never saw me lose my composure. So then fast forward to I've now retired. I have a baby and a toddler at home. He gets home from work and I'm crying and I'm in sweatpants with no makeup and my hair's a disaster. And I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. <laughs> This kid is gonna kill me. I can't do this anymore. So it's so much harder. You're doing a job that you can't leave behind. Not that you really leave behind news because you're always kind of working, but, but you, can, you don't have to be with your bosses all day long. You can go home. Here, my little bosses are always around. Get me some water, <laughs> make me some breakfast. Did you wash my jersey? Can I use your makeup? I can't escape these people, you know? <laughs> And it's hard. Every mom out there will tell you it's hard. But when that little guy gets home from football, like he did a few minutes before I started talking to you, and tells you, so I mossed this guy, and I got a touchdown in the end zone, and barely in the and It's just, it's what life's about. When yeah, your daughter is good. watching you do your makeup, well, mom, you're putting on makeup? Because, you know, they haven't seen me with makeup in six months. And she's like, what is that? Oh, is that eyeliner? And oh, that's how you put, I mean, those are the moments that fill your soul. And nothing I ever did in TV news compared with those moments, nothing. It's funny because you say, you know, you have that urge to impress people, but then when you realize that it's your little humans that you really, they're the only ones you need to impress and they're the ones who will be shaped and, and remember you and, and need you in that way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sometimes the the smaller life is the bigger life and you slow down to speed up, you slow down to achieve even more, you know, it's, it's so interesting the way that, that things change. Do you think you'd ever get back into TV? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I never rule anything out. I'll tell you that my, my gut will dictate that as it has yeah. everything else. I will say they're, they're getting older. You know, they, they don't need me as to be such a constant. Why does that happen? Why can't they stay little forever? I always, I, I, why I told my little boy every day, I said, did, did you say you think it bigger? <laughs> Stop growing. If you figure out how to do it, let me know. Although not really, because I'm going to tell you, I know Jace is little, but it gets better. It gets better. It's just He's four. Better. My husband says he can't get older than seven. That's the cutoff. Okay. <laughs> and then when he gets to be seven, he'll be like, oh yeah, this is fun too. And it, I know, you know, it does. But, but, the, but the truth is that they, they don't need me as much. So I do feel rumblings 
again. Uh, I don't know if it's TV. I know it's the next chapter for sure. I know it's coming. I haven't had that driving on the, looking at the Miami skyline moment yet, where I turn to my husband and say, this is what I'm doing, but it's coming. I can feel it. I just don't know what it looks like yet, but it's exciting. I think that's such an important, it is. It's such an important takeaway, I think too, for people to really listen to the feelings. Like I, I, I used to call it, when I was a kid, I called it tingle palms. What did you call it? tingle palms. I mean, I was little when I came up with this, but when I would get so excited about an idea, and generally for me, it was about writing. I would get so excited. I knew it was a good one if I got tingle palms. And to this day, I mean, I don't call it that necessarily in daily conversation, but I still get that feeling where it's almost like a little catch of the breath where you say, I have an idea. Something, something is happening. And you can sense it if you pay attention to it. So I just want to remind everybody too, though, Maggie, that, you know, they're, they're watching, they can ask you questions. They can ask me questions. You know, that's the cool thing about this. If they want to, if they want, I don't know how many behind the scenes stories you'll tell, but uh, I think that I just want people to know that it's definitely not a closed conversation. Yes. So weigh in, I'm ask sorry. anything. I'm still trying to figure this out still. It's Maggie not- versus phone. Maggie. Maggie versus phone. And now I have this light that I'm trying to turn down because it's, Better it's on it? no the, the light is on your side it, it's not siding with the phone the phone still might be out to get you yeah okay all right i'm gonna leave it i'm gonna leave it alone <laughs> you know on the on the behind the scenes stories uh are there any you said that it was yes it was glamorous what was the most uh, the the biggest wow moment for you when you were like wow i i'm i'm at the top of my game here and this is what i thought it was like when people said hey you're a network news anchor was there any particular moment that really blew you away Okay, so before I get to, to those moments, you know, I, I want to keep it real for people. Because yeah. you and I both know well that 99% of the good job is zero glamour, right? I mean, yeah. they don't see us, but we're in a live truck while it's moving, doing your eyeliner and doing your, you know, and... and I did my makeup in the dark once and I wondered why I suddenly had black under my eye. And it wasn't black. I just couldn't tell in the dark. It was red because I had put my lipstick on as my cover up. And I was like, well, this is, this is going to be difficult to fix. Did you um, go on hair like that? I mean, I wiped it off, thank goodness. But it was a little bit of a mess. <laughs> but the things, that, the things that you're doing, yeah, you're bumping along in a live truck. I mean, I, I've been bungee corded in the back of a truck in a rolling chair while editing my own stuff to make <laughs> yes. deadline. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when, you, when you're staked out somewhere and, and you can't leave and it's a story that you're waiting for somebody to come out of the house because you want the shot and try to get the interview. Yes. What, you, knock, you knock on the door and say, can I please use your bathroom, stranger, that I've been mm-hmm. sitting outside your house all day? So pe- people always ask me that. It must be so glamorous. Yeah, it was for 5% of my career, but 95 was it. But you know what? I wouldn't trade it because it, the non-glamorous was so exhilarating. And if you have a passion for it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But to answer your question... I don't know. I mean, it, it was crazy that I had my hair done every day and my makeup and I had a wardrobe stylist and a guy, oh, a guy who would like stand on the set, James, the best, and just be in charge of my clothes. So, Bonnie, one time, wow. somehow my button, in my suit jacket came off in the middle of the show and in the um, commercial, he sewed it back on. Like, oh, like, I need a James in my life. I, everybody needs a James. I keep in touch with James. I love James. So things like that are crazy, and they were fantastic. Um, meeting the people that you meet, you know, all the celebrities and the newsmakers, that's pretty cool. And the takeaway from that is people are just people. Yeah. People always say, what was so-and-so like? And I'm like, very normal. Very, you know, nervous before going on air. Do I look okay? And, you know, people are people. And, and I love that. Um, oh, covering history, I would say. Because... The years on local news, I really, really enjoyed. But when I got to the network, I felt like I I was witnessing some historic moments. And I can't explain to you how incredible that feels. You know, I've kept a journal. It's fitting that I became a journalist because I've kept a journal since I was 10 years old. Um, Not so religiously anymore. But, you know, I, I always like telling people stories, my own story, other people's stories. And when I would have those, those historic um, encounters with people, I would write about them because I wanted to remember and I wanted to tell my kids about it. And so that was by far the coolest thing that I ever did. I think back to like the presidential election um, when Barack Obama won. 
uh, I covered the entire campaign. I was, I traveled with John McCain, who was his opponent, and I got to see what it was like to be on the trail with a presidential candidate. And then I got to be there um, in Chicago on election night when the Obamas came out with their little girls and gave the speech. And I have photos of that. I was there on inauguration day in Washington, DC. And, you know, it's like, you know, when I'm at Publix grocery shopping and I'm just an ordinary person, I sometimes have to think, did I really have those extraordinary experiences? <laughs> It seems so far away, so long removed, but it happened and no one can take it away from me. And it's, it's an unbelievable thing to have gotten to do. It's funny because extraordinary is, is interviewing presidents and, and extraordinary is taking your daughter to school. And I love that you have those two perspectives and you're lucky that you were able to, to do both. And I think that the idea that that happily ever after is a destination is what I like to explore because it's not, it's, it's a state of mind. It's a, it's an outlook, a perspective. And I think that you've had that every, every step of the way. Yes. I think that, you know, people might say, how could you be happy if you're not this anymore? You know, like you, you, you look at my Instagram feed, right? I keep it small and private. You know, I, I like mm -hmm. it. That way. I post pictures of my children and that's it. And that's my idea of a fantastic, full life. I have photos with every celebrity that I ever interviewed and every major event I ever covered. I could have this really schnazzy public Instagram where people would go, wow, I want her life. But that's not what it's about. That's not who I'm trying to impress. That's not what pleases me. It, for me, it's about something deeper. And maybe too, that's a product of getting older where you just kind of have more perspective on what really matters in your life. It, it could be that as well. Maybe I'm just getting old. <laughs> I think it, oh, we won't say getting old. We'll just say the seasons might be changing. I like what you said <laughs> that for every, for every season, there is a, there is a fairy tale, right? Yes. And you know, what about you, you have such a positive outlook, but what about the doubt? Was there ever any, any moment that you really, I don't want to say rock bottom by any means, but really questioned anything in the choices that you've made, or you've always just had such a strong connection with those gut feelings that you were okay. Sometimes, you know, I, I wonder if it was necessary. Like I, I know that doing the job at the level that I was doing it, um, I wouldn't have been able to continue doing that and, and be the kind of mom I wanted to be. I know that for a fact. But I do, I have sometimes wondered if, if I, I don't know, if I could have maybe figured out a way to balance it better. You know, maybe, maybe that's my challenge. I'm kind of um, an all in kind of person. You know what I mean? Like if I'm, if I'm doing the job, then that's all I want to be doing. If I'm doing the parenting, then that's all that I want to be doing. And I'm fortunate that that's an option for me, you know, that we've always been really smart with our money, really conservative and lived below our means and saved up so that we do have choices and we are able to make those decisions. So, but, but I, you know, I've wondered that. I'm wondering, well, is there a happy medium that maybe I could have chosen instead of being so radical about things? And I don't know, but if I'm honest, I do wonder sometimes. I wonder too about if there's a, an, a way to be all in, and I, I wonder about this every day, can you be all in for chunks of time? Can you be all in while you're at work and all in while you're at yeah. home and not carry it in? But I, I also wonder if maybe what has happened with the pandemic and with all of this social distancing and the time that we're now spending at home and away from work in the same way, maybe there'll be a cultural shift because it's not necessarily what, what you were demanding of yourself, it's what our whole culture you know, demanded. You didn't have a... Yeah. There was no way to be in that job and be the kind of mom that you wanted to be. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, you wonder if there was a way to have balance? I don't know, I don't think so. I think I that's, why, that's why I'm talking to everybody about this because how do you find that balance and how do you walk that line and decide what is the right season of, of happily ever after in that moment and not, and not doubt it, you know? Yeah. I think a lot of people have a habit of regret instead of saying, hey, this is where I am. Yeah. How do I love it and be that, that best version? I agree with you 100%. I don't, I don't believe in regret at all. It's such a wasted emotion, right? Because if you're busy regretting something that you did or didn't do, what about right now? 
just either either live the moment or be actively working towards a goal. Don't look back. For me, looking back is is the devil and the enemy, and I don't do it. I don't do it. I only look back to remember the good times. Um, but what you said about balance, I think that you are a good example of somebody who seems, at least, to have figured it out, right? Because you're doing this job that takes you away from your family, yes, but not so much as it used to when you were in Boston. So right. I think that, you know, some people, if they're lucky, and if that's what they want to do, can find balance. It may require lifestyle changes and things that others might consider sacrifices, but in your case, it wasn't a sacrifice. It was actually an upgrade because you got to come here, find your beach and, you know, live your dream and, and the way that you've expanded, right? Because you started out as a journalist and now you're an author too. I think it just, if, if you have more time to kind of relax and take a step back, you have more time to think about what else could I be doing or what, what is the thing that's going to really fill me the most? And you, and I think because you did that, you found it. I don't know. That's me psychoanalyzing you. But I think <laughs> I'll take it. I like that analysis. No, I, I would say I'm finding it. And actually these conversations that I'm having uh, are part of it. You know, I, I was saying to some of my friends and family that whatever other people get out of it, I have gotten so much out of the conversations that I've had. And I don't know that people would have carved out the time in any other reality to, to have these discussions and sort of introspective conversations publicly, you know? So, so for me, I'm like, hmm, well, Maggie, thank you for my therapy. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's great to be able to bounce our ideas off each other, especially when we have the tendency to look at each other's lives and say, they've got it figured out. They have it better than me. Uh, they're always, you know, calm and composed because it's all, it's all an act, you know, we're all just trying to figure it out. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, Absolutely. And that's, that's why these conversations are so great. You know, that's one of the talks I have with my daughter about social media all the time because she's just entering that world. Mm -hmm. but be careful because what you see is not, is not really what it is. I mean, are you going to post a photo of yourself when you, when you, you know, back then when I was crying with my hair a mess and, and my husband saw me and th thought I was a disaster? Those aren't the moments you post. You post when you, when you look the best, your most glamorous moments. But I think that that's one of the dangers that if you look at social media too much, there's a danger that you could get caught up in it and think, I should be doing more. I should have that life. I should be doing what that person's doing. You have to resist that temptation. I know it's hard for people but I have this talk with my daughter all the time. Just live your life, figure out your goal, what makes you happy, work towards it, and that's it. Don't look at what so-and-so is doing because so-and-so has a different life and probably a different goal. And you're not seeing so-and-so's entire life anyway. And you know what's, what's crazy about that? I just thought of this right now. It's not even that you're comparing yourself to other people. You end up comparing yourself to the perfect version of yourself. When you put, only the best pictures out there, it's almost like you have created this, this false identity and this false version of yourself. So then when you do have those sweatpants crying moments, you feel worse about them because you've fallen off this pedestal that, that you're putting out you know, the image of yourself to the world. And yes. I've certainly, you know, I, I've struggled with that where there's this version of, of me that I think I'm supposed to be. And I'm my own hardest, toughest critic. I am supposed to be this, but so why am I fumbling around and forgetting to pay bills and having a messy house and emotional about this or that? And you know, all the things that is just being a parent and being human. Being human, that's why. Being human, yeah. We're, we're all a bunch of beautiful messes. I love it. Exactly. And yeah, I wish we would put that out there more because that's, that's the truth and that's the reality and that's the beauty of it. You know, I asked for uh, questions to see if anybody wanted to, to weigh in. And I got, I got this really interesting question a while ago. It said, is it true that her husband is incredibly handsome? She's married <laughs> to an incredibly handsome man. I feel Who like that, I feel like that guy's name was Mike. Oh, my husband is asking questions. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> ready to that's hysterical. Yeah, that's not what happened. <laughs> Oh, no, now my husband says, I heard the same thing about Sorbani's husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why they get along so well, because they're so unbelievably attractive, both of them. Right, and they're so funny, too. 
<laughs> what is happening with my light? I'm sorry. This is all. No, you're fine. You it's know what? Though? Okay. Look at that on a on a Thursday night. They're <laughs> they're watching they're watching us chat from the other I room, know. and that's support. And I see the people yes. who are logged on tonight, uh, friends from you know other states, and right here. Aww. And it's just so great to see. And and Maggie, what's fun too is after I post it, more people will watch, and I know they're going to get so much out of this conversation. Um, if people haven't been watching, you know, for the entire time, you know, we, we call it, it that you probably did this 10,000 times, right? When you're covering breaking news where you yes. do like the reset at the top of the hour. Yes. And you'd have to say, okay, if you're just joining us now, this is what we've been talking about. We've been talking about, you know, this fire, this what, whatever. But if you're just joining us now, we've been talking to Maggie Rodriguez. Yes. And I think that I really want to reiterate what you were saying that that you write your own fairy tale and you have to trust your gut instinct. I think that that's something that is a piece of advice that's been uniquely yours and the people that I've talked to so far that people need to pay attention to those little nagging nagging feelings because they're signs. Yes, I think to recap, I think that if you want a happily ever after because I think that's one of the problems with fairy tales and why I was never really into them. I always thought the happily ever afters were, were not realistic. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you want a true happily ever after, you have to write your own fairy tale. And it starts with defining happiness for yourself, not how society defines it, for yourself, for your family. And once you know what that definition is, then do the things that'll get you there work towards it. There will be temptations that will want to take you away. Stay true to yourself, stay true to your goal, and you'll get as close as you can get. You might even, if you're lucky, achieve it. And know that there are going to be plot twists along the way, and that's fine. That makes stories more exciting, as you especially know. Plot twists are good. They shake you up, they make you rethink, and they sometimes take you in a direction that you never imagined, but that winds up being better than anything you could have ever planned or imagined. And constantly reevaluate. Don't work off the same goal that you started with because you change, life changes, you evolve. I was single, I was career driven. Then I got married and had children and I was family driven. Now my kids are getting older and I'm thinking, hmm, maybe it's time to write chapter three. And what does that look like? I am constantly thinking and open and eager to hear the signs that, you know, God and life put in front of me. Well, I can't wait to see what happens next. And I think that that summed it up so perfectly. <laughs> I think that we can leave it at that. And I can't wait to see you in real life again, because this pandemic is just keeping me away from everyone I love. I know. It's really, oh. really nice to, to see you again and talk to you, even if only like this. I mean, we do have to do one of our double dates again. <laughs> yes, we we'll do. See, maybe we'll grill outside. You know? Yes, a good, a socially distant double date, I think, is, is wonderful. And that was such amazing advice. Thank you for taking some time away from your family and, and uh, taking on the technology of your phone. I'm going to go ahead and say you that won that battle. That you slayed me. that dragon. You slayed Thank that you. dragon. <laughs> Thank you. You're the best. And by the way, I just want to say... I, I'm, I'm such a big fan of yours. I admire you so much. You're so talented, creative, and, and go Sarvani. You're, you're unbelievable. And Buck came out of the room to say, yeah. Tell oh, her hi, I feel Buck. Safe. Where's my Quincy? <laughs> Buck and Quincy are twins. And that is a surreal moment because everything that you achieved was, was the sparkling pinnacle of a version of my fairy tale. And then... <laughs> I changed and seasons change and all of that. But to have you saying that to me is just a, a, a bizarre thing because I think that what you've achieved is amazing. And I think the choices that you've made to put your family first is something that, that people can really take a lot away from because you said something earlier where you said, I was worried that I was just going to be a mom. And there's no such thing as just about it. It is, it is, just the only thing that matters in so many ways. And you know, for people who, who aren't parents and don't have that as their goal, there is another thing that maybe fulfills them in that same way. It has nothing to do with necessarily parenthood as far as just just knowing yeah. what, what that, that happiness is and, and coming in for that landing. So. I think my, my husband, my incredibly good looking husband, yeah. puts it really well. He says, you know, when you die on your tombstone, is it gonna say, she was a fantastic network anchor or she was a fantastic wife and mother. 
So. You know, this is weird and I am not making this up, but my husband has said almost the identical thing to me. Wow. Where he said, who's going to remember you? Oh, she was a great reporter. She was an intrepid journalist. Or is it going to be she was a wonderful friend, wife, mother, whatever it is that we are to the people in those circles. So, huh, there you go. Look they at that. Wise. <laughs> <laughs> we chose well. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so good to see you, Maggie. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. See you later. And everybody, okay. thank you so much for tuning in. This is all about slaying your dragons, all about finding your fairy tale. And remember, you write your own fairy tale. Amen. Good night, everybody.